All right, everybody, we'll get started again. Thanks for, thanks for coming back. Um, good morning, still, I think. Yeah. Um, OK, so welcome to panel four, uh, Designing the Russian Revolution and Soviet History. Uh, we have uh, slated three papers. So far, our, 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 one of our speakers is, is MIA. Um, Olga's not here. So we've got two papers um, that engage the landscape of the Russian Revolution uh, as an interplay of various forms of mediated experience uh, from publications and mass spectacles to architectural designs and the built and lived environment more generally. So I think that they'll have you know, a lot to say to each other, obviously. Uh, but I think also that these papers stay at different moments of the story. Um, and while it's always true, just in terms of existence, it's maybe especially true in terms of the Russian Revolution, that the various sort of moments are coincident, right? But I think that the, maybe they focus in on different moments, these papers. One sort of thinking about the events of the revolution as they're unfolding and trying to explain and disseminate them sort of in the present. Um, and then the other one is dealing with sort of planning prospectively and then dealing with memory retrospectively. So we'll see how these you know, similarities and differences play out. But okay, move along. Our first speaker is Katerina Romanenko, holds a PhD uh, from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Uh, she's a specialist in 20th century visual culture, focusing on Soviet mass circulated magazines and the role that they played in the visual culture of Stalin's regime. Um, she's published her work in Design Issues and Similarly Journal. She teaches art history at Keene University and works as an educator at the Guggenheim Museum uptown. And today she's gonna get, tell us uh, I'm going to present a paper entitled Design and Celebration of the Revolution, Representation of the Celebratory Rituals in 1930s Soviet Illustrated Press. Just a slight correction. As of April 1st, I work in National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia. And I will need that because I lost my voice right before the event. So can you hear me? Well, okay. So in this talk, I highlight some of the ways the two major illustrated magazines for women, Soviet magazines for women, participated in the construction of Soviet celebratory discourse. These are Rabotnitsa, which means female worker, and Kristyanka, which means female peasant. Specifically, and in accordance with the theme of the conference, I focus on the vis visualization of the 1917th October uh, Revolution celebrations. This presentation is part of the larger study, part of my dissertation, which I'm also expanding, in which I analyze visual content and cultural role of the periodical press in the uh, period between the wars. October anniversary was essentially a new holiday directly associated with the victory of the revolution clear of any pre-existing history, unlike May 1st, for example. Historian uh, Frederick Corney demonstrated convincingly how the revolution entered the collective Soviet memory as a um, laboriously constructed narrative. The Bolsheviks party slowly transformed the chaotic polyphonic memory of October 17th by turning contradictory descriptions of what happened into an orchestrated alluring drama of the revolution. Needless to say that periodical press played an essential role in the process. Appearing from early 1920s, Robotnica and Kristyanka were the only popular and widely distributed central periodical uh, magazines, which were continually published in the 1920s and then in the 1930s. Intended for the general consumption, these publications provide representative examples of the period's iconographic and stylistic conventions, at the same time, they served specifically defined segments of society, respectively working and peasant women. Thus, they offer a unique opportunity to see a process of shaping of specific cultural paradigm. A typical issue dedicated to the October anniversary came out filled with images incorporating graphic uh, details, decorating celebratory articles, reproduction of artworks, portraits of the leaders and Soviet heroes. It also featured a special cover design an elaborate double or single page spread, uh, usually filled with photographs as shown here on the screen. Overall, all types of design solution and illustrations were employed in order to generate the flamboyant mood of the occasion, turning the celebratory issue into event on its own. 
It should be noted that proliferation of illustrations in the Soviet press sh should not be taken for granted. After the Civil War, the regaining the very ability to reproduce imagery required significant efforts and involved considerable cost and labor. Robotnice and Kristianka were published as supplements of the largest daily newspapers in circulation, uh, Pravda for Robotnice and Kristianska Gazeta for Kristianka. And despite of the benefits and technical support, the quality of women's magazine, along with other mass circulated periodicals, was under critical fire, especially in the early 1930s. The editor's neglect of design issues was named among the major reasons for the poor quality of the printed products. The editors, in their turn, laid the blame, among other things, on the shortage of professional artists and designers trained to work in the illustrated press. And they had their uh, right to say so. Graphic design education did not exist in Russia prior to the October Revolution in any structured form. The layout artists were usually graduates of fine art schools and had no training preparing them to work in press. From 1924, graphic design and newspaper production courses were offered by several institutions in Moscow and Leningrad and other major cities, but the only place intended to produce professional graphic designers was Futimas, the higher artistic technical workshops. Apparently, Futimas failed to supply sufficient number of professional designers and illustrators for the press. In 1929, in an open letter to the Journal for Publishers and Professionals, Press Professionals, journal, jur, jur, journalist, journalist Ivan Isgoyev, one of the editors, pointed out the evident lack of polygraphy or printed press artists and reprimanded those who did not graduate for, quote, going out of their way in order to remain in Moscow and St. Petersburg, end of quote. According to Izgoyev, they rejected the benefits of full-time employment in provinces, choosing to lead, as Izgoyev saw it, an easy existence based on various odd jobs. Izgoyev vividly described the desperate editor from Vladivostok, which is located on the Pacific coast of Russia, complaining bitterly about his failed attempt to entice an artist to work in his newspaper. And this is in spite of his willingness to, quote, tempt the artist with whatever one wants, the climate, the sea, proximity to Japan and China, end of quote. In other words, Fodimas graduates preferred to stay in Moscow and St. Petersburg, even though it meant a meager income based on occasional commissions that forced them to work for several publishers and journals, simultaneously producing lower quality of work. And from memoirs of the artists, uh, it, it, uh, this account is confirmed. Many say that uh, they had to do so. In addition to the technical issues and lack of professional designers, the illustrated press was also subject to copyrights, royalty payments, work distribution uh, agreements, and other aspects of cultural politics. And for the lack of time, I'm not discussing this. The bottom line is that reproducing a painting or a drawing in press was quite expensive. Many periodicals could not afford to commission high quality reproductions and designs from established artists. Uh, mass periodicals such as Robotnice and Kristianka usually preferred cheaper stock images already in mass circulation and extensively relied on much cheaper photo-based illustrations. And that's where photomontage comes to the rescue as it offered a practical solution to many technical problems that crippled illustrated place, uh, press. Sorry. It was, quote, a way to combine on the same visual surface a number of various photographs unified by the same content and specific compositional arrangements, end of quote. And I'm citing the manual for, for press professionals how to use illustrations in press. It also helps to deal with often poor quality of images supplied by local correspondents and available in uh, photo agency. So the magazines embraced photo montage's capability to organize visual material and to deliver messages packed with visual codes and symbols. The medium effectively combined the immediacy of documentary and documentary power of photography with illusionism and the photograph sorry, and artistic freedom of painting and drawing. It proved to be especially handy in the design of the celebration issues. The primary subject associated with the celebratory iconography was the theme of industrialization. The Soviet celebrations of the first and second five-year plan were major spectacles demonstrating the results and expressing the support of the socialist project. 
The motif of a factory smokestack became a typical iconographic element used to symbolize the fulfillment of the industrialization program that would lead to the promised future. This motif is especially prominent in Robotnica's cover for the 12th October anniversary from 1929, shown here, in which a uh, slogan, long life, the 12th Oct anniversary of October, is stretched diagonally over the photograph of a factory smokestacks. Visualizing the first five-year plan course to industrialization, the smokestacks here take an independent, almost abstract appearance personifying industrialization is evidence of the revolution's success. From 1931 till roughly 1936, photomontage dominated the cover design of the celebratory issues in both magazines. For example, in 1931, October issue of Kristianka suggests the industrialization theme with a photomontage that combines a photograph of a woman's head superimposed over a photographic image of an industrial plant. Wearing kerchief tied in a peasant manner, the woman holds a red flag that expands upward and merges into the background of the magazine's title, Christianka. As a result, the design establishes a symbolic link between the triumph of the revolution, industrialization, and peasantry, connecting this both visually and linguistically. The 1932 October anniversary cover of Robotnica featured a montage with diagonally placed images of industrial projects and construction sites superimposed on a view of a West mass gathering of people. At the bottom of the montage, the artist placed images of tractors and other agricultural machinery. At the lower part of the composition, a portrait of Stalin is seamlessly squeezed in between two images of some construction sites while Lenin, the mastermind of the revolution, appears on the banners above. And I hope you can see all these details. Now, by 1936, Stalin assumes his larger-than-life um, position, extensively discussed by many scholars, and exemplified here by the 1936 October issue of Kristianka. So that would become a typical way to represent him. Now, parallel to the cover designs, photomontage flourished in the interior parts of the celebration issues, featuring different levels of professionalism, and, uh, so, and inner spread montages focused on elaborate presentation of parades and festivities, employing a variety of techniques developed uh, from mid-1920s, such as diagonal layout, interchange of close-ups and aerial views, additions of graphic details, etc. Now, traditional art history discusses photomontage as the medium of avant-garde and therefore presumes that the medium was no longer in use after 1932 as a result of the move away from experimentation in general. Analysis of the mass periodicals indicates that indeed by mid-1930s, photomontage was used in moderation on the covers. Lenin, Stalin, construction sites, and demonstration crowds routinely appeared in the October anniversary representations, yet the complex and detailed compositions of the first five-year plan, cover, uh, five plan covers would eventually be replaced by a simplified formula such as you have on the screen. After 1936, the designs became increasingly schematic with a great use of abstract symbols of the revolution and the celebration such as flags, flowers, Kremlin Tower, the iconic double portrait of Stalin and Lenin, which would become uh, standard for October iconography. And since we have a little bit more time than planned originally, I just want to uh, add that the original design of this double portrait was initiated by Klutzis, Gustav Klutzis, the photomontage artist, but it would become really the iconic image and we would see uh, combinations of photographs or graphic representations, so it was really an emblem. So while covers move away from photomontage, um, it continues to flourish in the interior parts of the periodicals where it was used parallel to the reproductions of paintings and graphic arts. Due to the time limit, I will focus on one representative example from the late 1930s, namely 1938. And here in the 1938 Christianka October anniversary issue, we have photomontage entitled The Celebration of Power and Military uh, Preparedness or Celebration of Strength 
and military uh, readiness appropriately filled with images of various military divisions. The center is reserved for a circular image of women in uniform underlining the female readership of the periodical. The overall composition is that of an arrangement of full frame photographs confirming the move away from more radical photo montage of the early period where images were cropped and arranged in more complex layout. Images depict various groups participating in the celebrations. None of the places or people is identified either by caption or by text, yet the text implies that the celebration took place across the whole country. Now, closer inspection of the individual and seemingly intact frames reveal their montaged nature. The middle image on the left combines a view of female military unit on, in the foreground with a line of women in kerchiefs behind them. On the right side of the spread, a woman, a group of women dressed in uh, Romani or gypsy national costumes dance in front of the crowd of striding men and women. Log houses referencing uh, the countryside can be seen in the background. Such houses were, ho houses were previously used to indicate the past, but this time they are large and in good shape, precluding direct associations with the pre-revolutionary period. In the distant background, large factory smokestacks protrude from behind the houses, alluding to industrialization as a backbone of the happiness expressed on the foreground. Now, curiously, identical elements appeared in Robotnica of the same year. Here, they are placed on the lower left side in a slightly different combination. And I'll try to show the details, so just to clarify, uh, in the upper corner is an image, the detail from Robotnica, and below is the Kristianka spread. So, gypsy performers present at the upper part of the detail in Robotnica, um, also present in Kristianka, only here they dance in front of the different crowd. The left side of the October spread repeats the fragment, combining women in kerchiefs with those in uniforms. And women in uniform that were the focal point in Kristianka appear as well, but this time they're not in circular frame and just appear as part of the crowd. Now military machinery is also repeated um, and basically only the, the image of the leaders uh, and some other details are different. Now, unlike Kristianka, Robotnica identified each detail with captions from which we learn, and I'll try to move to another slide, so I think just details are better. So we're looking at Robotnica's detail, and what appears is the details from Kristianka. So the women, um, dan the, sorry, the dancers performed in Chiluskin Square in the city of Gorky. The women in kerchiefs participated in the demonstration in the collective farm square in the Bauman district of Moscow and the young women in uniform are students of the School for Civic Aircraft Pilots. Now it is tempting to speculate uh, about possible reasons for such rotation and recycling of images. I believe that the spread was created by the same artist who just completed the, and received money from both magazines. But it also could be that uh, they recycled images uh, already available um, and even recycled details of photo montage probably published in some other magazine or maybe even their newspaper, the mother newspaper. But I will return to the main point of my presentation. Um, despite of the controversial associations uh, with condemned formalism, photo montage proved to be an indispensable design solution for the representation of celebratory rituals. As it served to transgress the limitations of time and space, it compensated for the poor quality of the stock imagery, ensuring that important details are clear. It helped to overcome the otherwise fixed character of photographic representation and to establish the illusion of simultaneity of experiences across the country. The emphasis on the different part of the celebration and places revealed the desire to create a feeling of the shared all-union celebration. 
The magazines visualize the celebrations, setting an example, instructing, providing points of comparison, and ensuring that every Soviet individual would be an ave, sorry, an O of the sheer scale and spirit of the all union experience, while at the same time we'll be able to relate to this experience. Thank you. Questions later, right? Yeah. That announcement was, we might have a third paper, but we still don't know. <laughs> we do, we do, okay. We do have a third paper. So we'll be able to hit all the moments in time. Our next speaker is Olive Vronskaya. She's a PhD candidate in history, theory, and criticism of art and architecture at MIT. And she's working on a dissertation about the impact and effect of psychophysiological aesthetics on Soviet avant-garde architectural theory and practice. She's received junior fellowship from the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library in Washington, D.C., and also from the Getty Foundation, um, a pre-doctoral fellowship. Uh, her research has been published in Thresholds and Studies in the History of Gardens and Design Landscapes. And today, we have two titles of your paper. Which one? From Analysis? From Analysis, yes. She's going to deliver a paper called From Analysis to Synthesis, Soviet Modernist Architecture as Organization. introduction and thank you very much the organizers for bringing us here and thank you to all of you for coming and I apologize for changing my title that doesn't match the one in the brochure now um, okay I also apologize for my voice that it's not at its best because I have a cold Alexander Bogdanov a Russian philosopher and revolutionary who in 1908 competed with Lenin for the status of the leader of Bolshevik faction, challenging Lenin's position from the left, in 1913 expressed his vision of the tasks and methods of revolutionary activity in a utopian novel called Engineer Many. Engineer Many. The main protagonist of the novel is a young Martian engineer with Nietzschean Ubermenschian ambitions he wants to create an extensive network of canals that would transform a huge Martian desert, Livia, into a fertile landscape, agricultural landscape. Moreover, he insists on being the only person responsible for the organization of the works. Of all their technical, financial, and other aspects, making the rulers of Mars doubt his capacities and suspect his potential political ambitions. A wise old minister, however, reassures his colleagues. I quote, Many is not a competitor of ours, precisely because his ambitions are extreme. He is not interested in becoming a minister or the president of the republic. Moreover, he would not even want to be the financial ruler of the world. His book about Livia ends with the words, All deserts of the world have a future. He has the ambitions of gods." Unquote. Organization for Bogdanov was nothing else but the creative divine work. This presentation will assess the use of the notion of organization as defined and elaborated by Bogdanov in the context of Soviet modernist theory of architecture, in particular in the work of the circle of architect Nikolai Ladovsky. A prominent pedagogue at Moscow Hutamas, Higher Art and Technical Studios, and the leader of the so-called rationalist movement in architecture. I will start with Ladovsky's theoretical roots, which he, as well as Bogdanov, found in Ernst Mach's philosophy of imperial criticism, and will then demonstrate how Ladovsky, following Bogdanov's thought, 
incorporated the notion of organization in the imperial criticist program and thereby demonstrated ambitions no more modest than those of engineer many. Empirical criticism was developed by Austrian physicist and philosopher of science Ernst Mach and promoted in Russia by Bogdanov, who edited the Russian edition of Mach's major work, Die Analyse der Empfindungen, from 1886. Sometimes called second positivism, to distinguish it from the first positivism of Auguste Comte and the third linguistic positivism of the Vienna Circle, empirical criticism sought a philosophical substantiation for contemporary science. It attempted to make philosophy scientifically precise by grounding it in the achievements of experimental psychology, a science of mind that gained popularity in the 1870s at the same time as empirical criticism. Since ontologically the world remained beyond our perceptive capacities, empirical criticism suggested studying its phenomenological representation, thus reducing it to subjective sensations of physical properties, such as colors, sounds, temperatures, times, spaces, and so on. As every physical quality, or in Marx's terminology, element, existed in mind as a sensation, the old dualism of spirit and matter was overcome. These elements sensations were organized into complexes, which, although never absolutely stable, demonstrated a certain permanency, and for the sake of easiness of our orientation in the world, were called bodies. Nobody was absolutely stable in Marx's view, not even the human eye. This postulation allowed Mach to argue for the principal inseparability between the eye and the world, an idea illustrated by his drawing, demonstrating how much closing one eye, left eye, changed the perceived picture of the world, forcefully merging our body with it. The picture of external, re external reality seen by Mach was now framed with his own mustache, seen here, his nose, his eyebrow, while his legs and hands here were perceived as a seamless part of the environment. Max's analysis, introduced to Russian audience by Bogdanov, was utilized by Ladovsky, who applied it to the theory of architecture. I quote from Ladovsky, I will introduce you to the opinion of Mach, to his argumentation. You have drawn a construction, and you argue that this is architecture. Let us take a clock. It too has a construction, but it does not make it architecture. We have, therefore, to start with establishing scientific terms. Mach says, objects do not exist in the world. Before, some theoreticians and philosophers told us that an object exists, while others claimed that only our perceptions were real. Both arguments, it seemed, were correct, but no one could recognize a mistake in the assumptions. There is no difference between you and a thing. I can be infinitely extended. Existent are your body, mind, clock. A body is connected to a thing through the eye and the brain. I say about an eye, this is me, but I can also say the clock is me. There is no boundary between myself and the external world. I can connect myself to the globe. There is no boundary, but there is a link that is convenient to confine oneself to. <clears throat> Accordingly, Ladowski's new architectural theory comprised of perceivable spatial qualities in the same way as Mach's epistemology imagined internalized universe as a set of elements of perception. Just as Mach suggested going from sensations to bodies, rather than from bodies to sensations, Ladowski wanted to start with defining architectural elements and only afterwards to develop a new notion of architecture. Quote, from a study of separate properties and qualities of a phenomenon to building on these foundations conclusions and definitions of the phenomenon itself." Unquote. These qualities, in turn, comprised elements of architecture and the object of architectural creativity. Space, form, and construction were taken as the three key elements of architecture, while the seven secondary ones were presented by mass, weight, volume, color, proportions, movement, and rhythm. Likewise, assignments given by Ladowski at his introductory course, Space, at Futamas, 
aimed at teaching students to see and express these elementary qualities, which were classified into geometrical and physical, including mechanical ones, forms and their perceived properties, and the means of the organization, relationships between forms. However, if Mach's analysis moved from complexes to sensations that form them, the synthesis of, of the rationalist practice moved in the opposite direction, from elements to their complexes. If the goal of Mach as a physicist was the most precise description of the physical world, the goal of architects rationalists was a creation, on the basis of Mach's description, of a new three-dimensional reality. A conceptual model for this transformation of imperial criticism could have been found in the philosophy of Bogdanov, namely in his universal organization science or tectology. Like philosophy, tectology operated with ideas and other products of human mind. However, if philosophy remained autonomous, exploring concepts for their own sake, tectology used them as a tool for planning and structural of practical activity. The whole complex, complex world of culture, language, ideas, and ultimately ideology belonged to the set of tectological instruments. Although subjective in their origin, they served the great objective purpose of reconfiguring the material world. In his book, Tektologia Vsyopshi Organizacionne Nauka, Tektology, the Universal Organization Science from 1913, Bogdanov stated, quote, theoretical philosophy aimed to find a unity of experience in the form of some universal explanation. It wanted to give a picture of the world, harmonically whole and understandable to everyone. Its tendency was contemplative. Tectology does not find but create, actively and organizationally. The explanation of organizational forms and methods by tectology leads not to a contemplation of their unity, but to a practical mastery over them." Unquote. Thus, rather than decomposing reality in its elements, which was the task of philosophy, whose highest point for Bogdanov was imperial criticism, tectology studied the laws of the elements organization within complexes. The term organization became a key one for the theory of composition, the development of which in the mid-1920s was delegated by Ladovsky to his younger colleagues, Viktor Balikhin, Mikhail Turkus, and Mikhail Korzhev. Applying tectology to the practical task of creating new material reality, these architects made another step forward. If Bogdanov explored the laws of elements organization within complexes, they aspired to study the laws of elements association into organized complexes. This process they termed artistic organization. According to Viktor Balikhin, who in 1926 uh, to 1928 taught a course that was called or Organization of Space at Futamas. Artistic organization was nothing else but a composition in three-dimensional space. Drawing a parallel with the principles of musical composition, Balikhin, Turkus, and Korzhev suggested four methods of composition in architecture. First, relation, ju juxtaposition of two magnitudes of forms and their elements such as nuance and contrast. Second, proportions, relations connect on three and more magnitudes. Third, meter, a row formed by identical forms recurring with different intervals. And finally, rhythm, a row formed by a transformation of form and interval. As a complex of elements, a composition had to demonstrate unity. There is a certain permanence of qualities that would allow a beholder to identify it as a form Unity guaranteed that the complex was a system subjected to the laws and principles of tectology and was thus navigable. The end point of movement imposed by an architect was architecturally expressed as the center of composition. Central organization tacitly attracted people to its core, provoking their movement in the desired direction, and thus allowed composition to, to fulfill its mission that the rationalist termed, quote unquote, dynamics, an organization of visual movement in the desired direction. A typical example of a rationalist student assignment, exercise on creating an expressive spatial design composition with architectural volumes, 
was submitted by Tatiana Druzhinina in 99, 1930. The model, an abstract assignment of spatial forms, is an enclosed, united, and dynamic composition. It suggests a diagonal movement here, directed towards the compositional center on the edge of the plane here, at the intersection of the major diagonal avenue and a subsidiary, subsidiary perpendicular route. Uh, the central of the three perpendicular blocks in the middle divides the composition into two equal parts whose symmetry and thus coherence within the whole is guaranteed by equal distances between the central and the side blocks. The slight off diagonal row of horizontal blocks increases the width of the, of the avenue towards the compositional center together with the greater length of the far left block. For a beholder at the starting point on the right, it makes the compositional center appear closer than it actually is. So the beholder stands here and is being directed unconsciously by the design of the park towards the compositional center. And finally, a curve going from the starting point towards the left indicates the possibility of a shift in direction here. So st by staying here, you already know that you have a choice of turning left. Utilizing the philosophical pro platform of the radically left wing of social democratic movement, first of all of Alexander Bakhtanov, ultra-left rationalist architects used Marx's analysis of perception for their own purposes, which were far from the epistemological goals of imperial criticism. In spite of constant accusations of formalism, the rationalist could not be further from a disinterested Kantian attitude to art. On the opposite, a study of perception was for them only a means to a practical end, the construction of a new revolutionary world, a world the key to which was given to architects alone. In the words of Boris Groys, who brought together Nietzsche, Riegel, and Bogdanov to define the essence of avant-garde art, the latter demonstrated, quote, a direct connection between the will to power and the artistic will to master the material and organize it according to laws dictated by the artists themselves. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. I think now we have a little pause while we upload. And our third speaker, Olga, Olga Zakina, Zakina um, from the Ekaterinburg Academy of Contemporary Art. Um, she holds a specialist degree in art history from Ural State University in Russia. She also holds uh, a master's in visual studies from SUNY Buffalo, which is funded by a Fulbright grant. Um, she lectures at the Ekaterinburg Academy of Contemporary Art in, in Russia, and she teaches courses in history and theory of art and morphology of contemporary art. And today she's presenting a paper called Place, Politics, Religion, Redesign of the Post-Soviet Urban Space. Hello. Um, place, Politics, and Religion redesign of the post-Soviet urban space. Mm -hmm. Last Friday on the 20th of April, the demolition of the object of cultural and historical heritage, the building of Passage in the center of the Russian city Yekaterinburg, was finally announced as illegal by the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation. Passage was built in 1916-25 in early constructivist style after the project of Konstantin Babikin, one of the main Yekaterinburg architects uh, of the early Soviet period. Originally, the building functioned as a commodity exchange. In 1950s, it was taken under the government's protection and reorganized for a shopping center. Two years ago, the building was bought by Malysheva 73, one of the leading real estate developers in Yekaterinburg, although still remaining under the government's protection. 
At 1 a.m. 8th of March 2012, it was rounded by the fence, half of the adjoined uh, park was cut down and the demolition started. Developers claim that their uh, bulldozing activity is not, is not a demolition, but a reconstruction. Although the project of the new passage edifies, 10 times bigger shopping center has nothing in common with the original one. Passage is significant for Yekaterinburg as the only one left object ancestor uh, of constructivism, an architectural style largely represented in the city by several constructivist villages, ensembles, and great amount of detached buildings. For example, the building was the first one on, um, in the city using the concrete supporting frame. Without Passage, Yekaterinburg constructivism seems as if appeared from nowhere or was brought from Moscow or St. Petersburg by renowned architects. Okay, here it is the plan that it's 10 times bigger. The object of cultural and historical heritage of earlier epoch, the 19th century house of the land survey Yarutin was illegally demolished during the night of April 26, 2009 by a bulldozer. After that, the same real estate developer Malasha 73 has built on its place the highest skyscraper in Russia outside the Moscow center. Several passers-by recorded the process on their cell phones and cameras, but the organizers of the demolition officially have never been found. Today the question remains, is there any chance that the decision of the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation may help to really con reconstruct Passage and cancel building of a new one? Valentin Dyakonov, Russian journalist and culture uh, expert, asked a, a rhetorical question in his presentation on public space and contemporary art, uh, Russian urban space. Is it possible that the public space in Russian cities does not remind one of corruption and law violation? Such examples of violent intervention of current developers into cultural and historical layers of previous epochs are endless. Starting its history in the late 17th century, Yekaterinburg's landscape today combines signs of three epochs, Imperial Russia, Soviet period, and the current young capitalist state. It is the latter one which aggressively determ determines the relationship between these chronological and symbolic layers. Today, Yekaterinburg is the third largest political and economic center in the Russian Federation, the capital of the Ural region and the major junction of Europe and Asia. With its enormous natural resources and metallurgical technologies, it has always been an industrial base of the Russian state. Since revolutionary turn, the break of the USSR in 1991, private businesses have been dynamically developing. In 2009, the city hosted summit, summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It lodged a bid to host 2018 FIFA World Cup and Expo 2020. Illegal demolition is paralleled by less aggressive but not less visible passive uh, deterioration of previous epoch signs. One of the constructivist villages in Yekaterinburg, the Cheka village, represents an ideal functional form of communist dwelling and introduces new living standards, absence of kitchens, common cafeteria, common laundry, hospital, kindergarten, culture club. The Cheka city also includes the hotel Iset and the culture club in the shape of seeker and hammer, the Soviet symbol, and the apartment and apartment buildings are f uh, as flying tenants. Today the whole complex is decaying, wooden floors, ceilings, and walls, utilities, while again officially being under the government's protection. Other Soviet epoch landmarks in the city center are concealed under the enormous billboards. Among them, the central post office, uh, built 1934, built in the shape of a tractor, a uh, Ural worker printing press, where in Soviet times all the newspapers east of Moscow were printed, which means where the politically designed image of the Soviet Union was generated, and already mentioned hotel is set of the Chika village. The examination of the relationship between the structural elements of the city's landscape 
thus manifestly witnesses its active redesign from the end of the 1990s. The relationship between chronological and symbolic layers thus include overlapping, replacement, aggressive attack, passive deterioration, and sometimes awkward collisions. As in this uh, uh, ensemble of the city's central square, named after 1905 revolution, with the monument to Lenin on it. Today, Russian Marxist revolutionary, with his confident gesture and passionate look, is welcoming to the shopping mall called Europe. Moreover, the building itself demonstrates a titanic looking like combination of original base, House of Merchants Karabkovy, uh, built in the classic and pseudo Gothic style in 1820s, and built over the top of it glass cubicle formation for the shopping center. Is such a situation only the result of the uneducated or, and corruptive businessmen's activity? Will punishment of barbarians and real reconstruction of Passage finally take place after its demolition was finally officially announced as illegal? To read metaphor metamorphosis of the landscape's current structure might be not enough to answer the question. But let me pay your attention to one element of the Yekaterinburg's landscape which makes it, it unique on the post-Soviet map of Russia. Yekaterinburg attracts a great amount of tourists, diplomats, and investors today. Surprisingly or not, the city represents itself today not as a constructivist city, for instance, but as the last Russian Tsar's execution, newly revived and modified junction of three epochs. The last Tsar of the Russian Empire, Empire Nicholas II, and his family wife and five children together with the court physician and surveyors, uh, after staying in Empatiev House, Yekaterinburg for three months under the surveillance of Bolsheviks, were executed by them in the cellar room of the house on the 17th of July, 1918. Today, the church on the blood of all saints in Russian land, the city's major tourist attraction, rises on this place, built 2003. The bodies of the executed were secretly transported into the woods 15 kilometers from Yekaterinburg, the place called Ganina Yama, and thrown into a pit. Today, this place has a monastery consisted of seven churches due to the number of the Nicholas II family members. In 1991, their remains were found, authenticated, and buried in St. Petersburg. In 2000, the Russian Orthodox Church canonized all the seven members of the Tsar family as passion bearers, which in Orthodox Christianity means people who face their death in a Christ-like manner, revealing no resistance to evil men and holding to the faith with pity and true love of God, no explicit murder for the faith. Since then, canonization has drawn a wide response in the Russian society. Main arguments disclaiming sanctity of Nicholas II respond to his well-known nickname Bloody, which, is, which he gained during his rule. I do not have time to talk about all the historical facts there, here, but just name some of them. The Hadinka, the Hadinka tragedy that occurred during the Nicholas coronation festivities and resulted in 1,400 deaths so-called Bloody Sunday on the 9th of January 1905, when unarmed, peaceful demonstrators, mostly peasants, carrying icons, portraits of dear father Tsar, and petition, and petition with a suggestion for liberal changes in Russia, were shot after Nicholas' order. His passive internal and disastrous foreign politics, his connection with Grigory Rasputin, finally his abdication in 1917, when the government wasn't Bolsheviks yet. Also, neither of four surveyors in the household of the Tsar family, executed together with them, were canonized as passion bearers. Nevertheless, canonization of the Tsar, of the Tsar's family, entailed sacralization of two places on the map of Yekaterinburg. The place of their murder, with the church and the blood um, on it today, and the place of their burial, um, at Genina, with Genina Yama mon Monastery. Thus, the feeling of suffer um, of guiltlessly killed people truly believing in God is implied to the place covered with their blood. 
the places transform into signs of their agony. And here I quote Roland Barthes from Myth Today. Such signification could very well be self-sufficient if it wasn't captured by myth. If myth did not take hold of it and did not turn it suddenly into an empty parasitical form, end quote. This image displays a tragic, crucial turning point in the Russian history. The whole three centuries Russian history under the Romanov imperial dynasty and over a thousand years of Russian monarchy in general ended with Nicholas' exec execution, turning Russia to the communism epoch. Behind the icon image, church and monastery, the signs of the Tsar's family execution and feelings of piety of uh, passion bearers, an invisible side of the signs appear, executors of the tragic, uh, irrevocable turn, Bolsheviks. They're also, behi they're also behind the visible side of the signs, intellectual repressions, lack of freedom, religious suppressions, and so forth are disposed. Barton veils the myth about the saluting a young Negro in a French uniform from Paris March, uh, which signifies that, Fran that, quote, France is a great empire that all her sons without any color discrimination faithfully serve under her flag, and that there is no better answer to the detractor's an alleged color, uh, colon I'm sorry, colonialism than the zeal shown by this Negro in uh, serving his so-called oppressors. Such advanced interpretation is possible due to the myth through which, due to the concept through which the whole, quote, the whole new history is implanted in the myth, end quote. He goes further to name the concept Great French Empire I would call the concept implanting the new history into the myth about colonization of the Tsar family and sacralization of two places, Orthodox Russia. The concept appears very opportunely, as after USSR collapse in 1991, the ideological vacuum has started to fill by politicized speech, as Barth call, calls myth. Edward Said, in his essay, Invention of Memory and Place, calls collective memory a social, political, and historical enterprise. It is a tool and very much something to be used, misused, and exploited." End quote. Said explores how Holocaust was consciously used by the Israeli government as a way of consolidating Israeli national uh, identity after years of not paying much attention to it. The same as Russian government used the newly invented tradition of religious honoring of the past as consolidating of Russian people and, ju and by juxtaposing new life to the Soviet times. Here the myth reveals three crucial features. The first one, the Soviet reality had a great priceless resource. The idea of the communist man who believes only in a better communist tomorrow instead of God, therefore, Therefore, all bloody pages of Soviet history could be explained by loss of their spiritual values, their lack of compassion and justice. Thus, the Orthodox Church provides a revival of moral and spiritual values. The second, under the veil of hatred to Bolsheviks, religious revival is tied with the revival of the respect and admiration for the monarchical Russia, especially considering the fact that the history of the Russian Tsarist rule starts in mid-9th century, just a century before the Christianization of Russia in 1988, in 988, I'm sorry. And the third feature, rendering justice to the victims of the communist regime brings up an idea of never again, in Said's words, which again serves as a tool for consolidating them so that the people without sorrow live for good all old life with intellectual repressions, lack of freedom, etc. From this perspective, the new Russian capitalist state's ideology evokes the mid-19th century dominant ideological doctrine of the Russian Empire. Orthodox, national, Orthodox Christ, um, I'm sorry.
Orthodox autocracy nationality. Sorry. Lenin's mausoleum in Moscow. Here you can see the picture. Great debates have flared up since the USSR collapsed, whether or not to bury the Lenin's body. The major part of the Russian society insists to get rid of it. At first sight, this landmark looks as an exact opposite to sacred places in Yekaterinburg. One official reason for keeping this, uh, this body on public display uh, is in the heart of Russia is that there is a whole institute organized during the Soviet period to take care of the body. And there is no way to leave these highly qualified specialists without job. Another is, quote Putin, there are still a lot of people of all the generation who relate their personal lives, lives with Lenin. For them, his burial would mean that they uh, adored to the false values and they lived in vain. But in fact, the mausoleum in Moscow functions the same way as sacred places in Yekaterinburg, as a machine permanently producing hatred to the socialist past and permanent urge to destroy everything connected to it. The French historian Pierre Nora calls such places as lieu de memoire, permanent dis, uh, depositories of information, archives, painfully transforming into institutes, such as Church and the Blood, which functions partly as a museum today, with displayed tables outside and inside the detailed and detailed biographical information of Romanov Imperial House. It also conducts an annual Orthodox festival. Place of memory, um, quote, gain a double nature, a site of access closed upon itself, concentrated in its own name, but also forever open to the full range of its possible significations and interpretations and growth inside. The territory of the invaded sacred land in the Ekaterinburg periodically widens. The block around the church and the blood in 2009 was renamed from Tolmachov, Soviet biologist, into the sacred block. The church's sculpture depicts the Tsar family around the cross and includes staircase consisting of 23 stairs. That is an exact number of the stairs which Romanovs had to go from the room where they lived in the Patyev house down to the cellar room. Thus the person is intended to participate in the passion bearers suffer and experience the feeling of never again. Worth to mention that the sculpture does not correspond to the tradition of Orthodox Christian art, but that is why it replaces the church by the place of memory. Every year on the night of the 7th, 17th of July, Christians uh, participate in a newly invented tradition of five hour pilgrimage from Ganina Yama to the church on the blood, nine miles. Many of the participants wear the Russian military uniforms, dated from the mid 19th century to the early 20th century, white guard uniform, thus, thus transforming the pilgrimage into a the theatrical enterprise, performing a battle with the Red Army. Conjunctions, collisions, interventions of chronological and symbolic layers in Yekaterinburg are actively shaped by current visual policy of extensively developing metropolis administration. Landmarks of earlier epochs, as well as the city's residents, uh, either have to struggle against attacks, such as blaring advertising billboards in the streets, illegal demo demolition of uh, historical monuments, and so forth, or attack themselves, participating in the current process of urban redesign and reshaping of collective memory. Yekaterinburg street artist Timofey Radia witnessed this inevitable necessity to make a choice and the impossibility to stay aside of this choice in his attack defense piece by putting the letters of the words attack defense by both sides of vertical ledges of the apartment building uh, in uh, the Yekaterinburg's center. His another work under the title Your Move represents large scale images of domino dice of the Yekaterinburg's uh, bridges supports. 
An interesting interplay appears between the bridge, solid, secure, connected, separated parts of the city, and its legs, huge, plain, and clumsy because of their scaled dice. Moreover, they are invisible for the bridge worker, uh, walkers and could only be seen from the northern part of the bridge where the floor grinding factory stays and the space in front of it is not intended for a sidewalk. Politics and religion function together in the post-Soviet urban landscape, producing ideology for the young capitalist state. Its seemingly firm ground seemingly successful development of the city reflects in the bridge's base, which appear to be a fragile and replaceable construction indicating somebody's game hidden before, hidden from the eyes of the Yekaterinburg residents. If the things aren't internal, it, eternal, we can replace them as we wish, comments Radia on his work. Thank you very much.